All right, everybody, welcome to another edition of the Leadership Blend Television Show with your host, Ricardo D. Rice. All right, so today we're gonna take a journey into money. Money matters, finance matters, all that good stuff. Stuff I probably am not, uh, not my thing, but uh, I can appreciate it because y'all know I have an MBA, so I can appreciate it. But I figured it's better to get somebody in the studio that knows all about this good stuff, particularly for women of color. So today, that's what we're going to be talking about. Finances for women, women of color. How do I start? Where do I start? How do I do it? How do I find a balance with that? All that good stuff. So this young lady I met uh, last year, I think the, the almost the ending of last year for MogulCon. She was a speaker. Um, we had an interview. I loved her. It was just so bubbly be great energy, great information. So I was saving her for an episode and that episode is today. So I'm gonna let her introduce herself and tell everybody about her. So take it away. Wow, thank you so much for that um, great intro semi-introduction. <laughs> um, but my name is Terrell Dinkins and I help people create financial roadmaps. And I think that's the best way to describe what I do. I'm also a wife, a wife of more than 20 years. Uh, yeah, 24 years, this is my 24. I can't even do a year relationship, let alone be married for 20 years. Uh, and I'm a mom, of, I have two, two teens, and I'm a fur mom. I have a fur baby, Onyx. Oh, dog. good Lord. Yeah. Uh, what kind of, is a dog? She, yes, yeah, she's a, uh, she's a half a poo. A what? A Havapoo. What is that? A mix of a Havanese and a Poodle. Oh, good God. Yeah, my little Havapoo. And... <laughs> is that what it's actually called? Did you make that up? No, no, it's called a Havapoo. They're called Havanese and a Poodle mix. Uh, you know, it's all part of that whole, you know, designer dogs. And people typically like to uh, mix dogs, uh, their dogs with Poodles. Because Poodles are really smart dogs. Yeah. Yeah. So my cute little papa have a poop. Uh, and I'm also a two time author, really uh, a two time author. I mean, I'm super excited about that. You're being modest. What what else about this author thing? You just had a development recently. So, so recently I, we were uh, I would just happen to be on uh, Amazon and I realized that I am uh, a top seller. My brand new book, Secrets of the 800 Plus uh, Club is a top seller. It's an Amazon bestseller. So I'm really super excited about that. Only the best for this show, only the best. I'm super, super excited about that. Look, I actually have a copy. Can I show my copy? Yeah, I was gonna let you do it later on. But okay, we'll, we'll wait. We'll I wait. mean, you done picked it up nine miles good. You done picked it up nine miles good. So yeah, it's Secrets of the 800 Plus Club, How to Raise Your Credit Score, Maintain Good Credit, and Live the Life of Unicorns. And hopefully we'll talk, get a chance to talk about the whole unicorn concept. All right. So let's start from the beginning. What is a financial planner? Because, you know, people say this, this term gets thrown around a lot. What is a financial planner? So so it really does get thrown around a lot. I think the word financial advisor gets thrown around it's, mm. it's a lot. Um, but I'm a licensed uh, planner. So um, I have a couple of designations and I'm licensed to manage money and I also write financial plans. And that's what I call roadmaps. And in my, um, with the plans, I look at seven different areas with clients. I look at their um, general cash flow um, and budgeting. I think when you're looking at your financial house, um, Typically, when we look at our financial house, or if we're building a regular house, your foundation is the most important thing. So when I'm building these plans for clients, the first area I look at is their cash flow. You know, do they have cash flow to build wealth? Um, and then the second area I look at is, you know, retirement. Uh, where are they now? Where do they want to be? And what, how do they want retirement to look at look like? Um, estate planning, taxes, investments, and then um, education funding. So I actually create these financial roadmaps for the clients. Um, I also manage money. So if a person wanted to um, open up an IRA or start doing investing, then I can actually open up those accounts for the clients. And I manage the whole process. Um, a typical, a lot of times I'll work with CPAs. A CPA may be working with a small business owner and that small and they realize that there's an opportunity for that small business owner to invest money. So they'll call me up and say, hey, I have a client for you. Um, you can help this, you know, set this set up a, a retirement account for the client. So um, so that's a full planner. Um, and um, so you have people that are financial coaches. You'll have a person that's a coach, but they're not legally licensed to manage money. Okay, so we talked about license sure before. Okay. What what should they have? Like if I'm looking for a financial planner, what should they what should I be looking for? Okay. So 
with with me, I am a registered investment advisor. So my firm is a registered investment advisor and th there's a difference. So I am considered a fiduciary. My firm is a fiduciary, which means that a fiduciary is a person who um, works at the for the best interest of the client and not necessarily for myself. I put my my wants aside and it's all about a client. So you have a lot of people that toss that word financial advisor around because it is a hodgepodge. So you have people that are in the industry that may sell insurance products. Um, you may have people that um, they may say they're an advisor, but they're really a coach. So for people that um, manage money, there are different la layers. So all right, well, you, hold that thought. We're gonna let's take a break, okay. and then we'll come back and get into that. Okay. All right, so we're gonna take our first break on the Leadership Bend Television Show with your host Ricardo D. Rice. All right, well, before we went on break, you were getting ready to get into the get down with the get down. <laughs> so you remember that thought? Yeah, I do. Okay. So let me just, kind of in a summary, you have people that manage money that are planners, and you have some people that are planners but that don't manage money. So you can actually give financial advice and then send that person somewhere else to, to manage money. So you, I always say you want to do a research. You can go to... Um, go to the SEC websites, broker check, and just check out the credentials. But if a person um, manages money, they have some license behind them to do that. Is there a certain license I should be looking for? Um, probably for, for the planner, a Series 65 license. You want to make sure a person has a 65 license for them to be uh, a fiduciary. And some of them have a six. 63, 65, 7. That, that's what I mean. It, it's like we're going into to, uh, <laughs> bushes because there are a lot of them out there. And I've, I've had a, a lot of those. Uh, but I would say the fiduciary, you want to make sure a person may have a 65 license. And then ask them if they're a fiduciary. A person will not say that they are if they're, they're not. You need to ask them, are you a fiduciary? Because you want to work with a fiduciary. A fiduciary is someone who's going to look out for your best interest and not necessarily for themselves. Like I don't uh -huh. sell a, my firm, I don't sell a particular product. I don't because I'm looking out for the best interest. I'm not trying to sell an insurance product. I'm really just trying to figure out what's best for you. Where are you right now? Where do you want to be? Okay. All right. Yeah. So let's, let's start from the beginning. Let's build this thing. Let's build so it. Let's, okay. let's build this thing. So let's start from the beginning. I'll, I'm a mother. I have three or four kids. Uh, I have a little money I could play with, uh, so if I came to you, where would I start? I, where would I start? So here's it. When you're going to um, see a planner, um, we find out where they are first. Everyone's on different levels. If you have, if I look at your cash flow and see that there's not a whole lot there. As disposable income or disposable, just in general? Disposable. Because that's, that's why when I'm doing the plans, I start with cash flow and budgeting first. Because your disposable income will determine whether you can even go to that next step of investing or uh, making sure you have your emergency fund set aside. So if a person came to me, the first thing I would look at is how much disposable cash do they have? And if they're doing a good job with the cash that they are bringing in. So I literally break down and look at their budget and look at their monthly expenditures and see where their money is going. So that's the normal uh, expenditures versus yeah. income, your, the your, normal where, sheet. Mm -hmm, that your expenses, where do your, where's your money going? Because I tell people all the time, you have to direct your money where you want your money to go. In order for you to build wealth, you need to steer your money. And if you're steering your money in the shopping malls, then you're not going to build wealth. So it's important to look at that cash flow first. If a person has good disposable income, but they don't have an emergency fund, then that means that's going to be the first place I, I go, is that you need to have some money set to the side in the event that you have an emergency that's not invested in a stock. Because I get that all the time. When, can I start, you know, they'll, I'll get a call if someone wants to invest in stocks. Well, think about this. What sense does it make to to invest in a stock that could potentially go down when you don't have an emergency fund. Okay, so on that note, okay. emergency fund, because I've heard different things. Some people say you should have enough money for a month worth of bills. I've heard six months. What is a good emergency fund? So here's what I say. If you have uh, income, if there's a two uh, income household, 
if there are two people in the household that's bringing the cash flow, three to six months. If it's just you, six to nine months of 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 your living expenses. And what I mean by living expenses, it may be less than what you think. Living expenses are those items um, that you would have to pay for if you lost your job. Food, shelter, clothing. Those are what I mean by living expenses. If you lost your job, you're not going to go to the hair salon. Yes. If you lost your job, you're not going to have a, a shopping budget. But if you lost your job, you'll still have to pay to uh, buy food. Mm -hmm. You'll have to still pay for your car note, your mortgage, uh, mortgage insurance, your life insurance, your car insurance. So those are the things that you want to have, six to nine. So that may be smaller than your regular budget. Like in my regular budget, I have, uh, you know, money on there, my fun money. I have a fun money account. I'm sure you do. I do. I'm looking at you. I'm looking at the way you look there. I know you have a fun account. <laughs> you know, I have, I have a fun money account. So if, if I lost my job, I wouldn't put money in a fun money account. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So that, that, that makes sense? a lot of sense. So that, so that budget doesn't necessarily have to be as large. And I tell people when you're ready to put money in the market, you're saying, I have enough money that I'm willing to start taking on some more risk. So without risk, there there aren't more rewards. And I think when we look at wealth building in general, uh, the bulk of the wealth that's made in this country is through the stock market and through real estate. Mm -hmm. And when we looked at 2020, uh, even though we were in a pandemic and people lost their jobs, there was a huge divide between Wall Street and Main Street. Wall Street made money in 2020. Yep. Main Street did not. And so for that mom, going back to that mom, I would still look at, you know, do you have extra money to do some of the other things? Because I think in order for us to close this huge wealth gap, uh, the people on Main Street need to walk across the street to Wall Street. Hold that thought. So we're going to take our second break. And when we come back, we're going to get more into that statement on the Leadership and Television Show with your host, Ricardo D. Rice. All right, so walk from Main Street to Wall Street. I like that. It's a good place to end, good place to pick up, pick up. All right, so using that same example, the young lady with the kids. All right, so you've had the meeting. What kind of money, what kind of disposable income would she need? Like we talking about three or four dollars. Like what are, what are See, we talking it's, about? It's so different. So for for new investors, I really feel like for brand new investors, then they need to think about some mutual funds. Mutual funds provides you more diversification uh, in a portfolio. And here's what I mean. Say hypothetically, and I'm going to just throw some names out and, and I'm going to put a disclaimer that these are things that I may not own. But say hypothetically, if you um, if you liked Nike and I'll use Nike as an example, um, Nike stock. So you buy Nike stock. Uh, and then the price of Nike may drop everywhere. So if Nike, you have the individual Nike stock, it may go down, but Nike may also be in a consumer discretionary mutual fund. So your sneakers are discretionary. It's a discretionary purchase, right? So there are mutual funds out there that may be called consumer discretionary. And inside that consumer discretionary mutual fund, you may have Nike, you may have uh, Adidas, you may have uh, Apple, Zoom, all of these are discretionary type things that you can purchase. So if you own just that Nike stock and, it, and that stock goes down, uh, it's going to go down everywhere else, but those other stocks may go up. So that mutual fund may actually perform better than just that individual stocks. So does that make sense? Because all the other ones will go up, so it makes that mutual fund rise. So but, basically, a mutual fund evens it out. It, yeah, it, it lessens diverse, the impact of the of the hit because of diversification. Hmm. So people need to be diversified now. A lot of these young uh, investors now they're opening up brokerage accounts because now. What's happening with the accounts is that you no longer have to have enough money to buy a full share of stock. You can buy partial stocks. So you have, you know, companies like um, uh, Robinhood. Um, I'm glad you said that. Okay. That's that's perfect. Yeah, that was my next question. People open up the brokerage accounts, and so what's happening is that you got these young investors now. Instead of them having um, uh, required to have money to buy a full share of stock, they can buy a partial share of stock based on how much money they have. 
So that's what apps like uh, Cash App does it too. They have that you can buy stocks and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, Robin Hood. Mm -hmm. uh, there's another. And a lot there. of them are out there now. I mean, you have the big ones, Charles Schwab and Fidelity. They all have, um, I think Fidelity has slices. So now you can buy partial shares of stock. So everyone now has gotten into the whole. Because I, I got me a couple of Apple sent me a nice little email saying you can vote because I had a little, little stock in <laughs> Apple. I saw that because you bought like... some shares of stock. And so with those, um, now that it's really, and I think Robin Hood was a leader in this, is really opened up the window for people to start investing. So I say now that if, if you can play around and, and buy some, throw money away on a pair of shoes, then you can be an investor. And I really feel like now uh, with the the way they've set up these brokerage accounts that everyone can be an investor and everyone can put money in the market. So I really feel like everyone, yeah, do your homework, make sure you have your, your coins set aside in case there's an emergency, but I think everyone should be investing right now. It, there's, you have to. That's the only way that you're going to build wealth. You're not going to build wealth keeping your money in cash. So when we think about stocks and things of that magnitude, are we thinking about, because uh, I know liquidity is a thing, being able to get money when you need it versus having money in stocks that kind of go up and down so, and things of that so, magnitude. So liquidity just means how, how fast am I able to liquidate that particular item to cash? So, you know, I, I talked about how the bulk of the wealth, wealth is in real estate in the stock market, but the stock market is a little bit more liquid than real estate because I can literally liquidate and sell my stock now. But if I had my money in real estate, uh, well, and I'll do a caveat to that. If I had my, my money in a physical building or a resident, I couldn't necessarily liquidate it overnight. However, you have different types of, uh, stock assets that you can buy a stock REIT, a real estate investment trust, and put money in real estate that way, which basically is you're buying stocks in, in real estate that you can liquidate like a stock. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. I, I can grasp that. I can okay. grasp that. Okay. All right. So sitting down with this young lady with the kids, uh, she has enough money to do it. So she decides to do some stocks. She does Robin Hood or some cash app, get some little things. What would be her next move? Um. So here's the thing. So this is I really feel like, and I'm not just doing this to put my first book, uh, One Bucket at a Time, A Woman's Got to Create Wealth, I really lay out how that looks. So my goal when I'm working with all of my clients is for them to eventually get to a point where they've created multiple buckets of money. And what I mean by multiple buckets of money is they have uh, a short term, a mid term, long term and a guaranteed bucket of money. So for this woman that we're talking about, the first bucket of money that everyone should create should create is that short term bucket of money, meaning that I got cash or I may have some short term CDs where I can liquidate that money in the event that I have an emergency. And then I'm going to skip over my favorite bucket and I'll go to the long term bucket. So your long term bucket is your retirement bucket. So um, you want to put money away for retirement because especially for women and we talk about women, we we're born with a blessing and a curse. All right. Hold that thought. That's, okay. that's a good place to stop. All right. So we're going to take our last break. And when we come back, we'll have more Miss Dinkins and we're going to talk about retirement, all that good stuff. So stick around the leadership and television show with your host, Ricardo D. Rice. All right, blessing and a curse. Oh. What does that mean? All right, so what I mean by women are born with the blessing and curse. The blessing is we will probably outlive our male counterparts. Mm -hmm. And the curse is we will probably outlive our male counterparts. Because believe it or not, longevity is not always a blessing. You can live a long time and it costs you money because one of the biggest fears with people going into retirement is that they're going to outlive their money. If I outlive my money, what is my life going to look like in retirement? So in my book, my goal is to try to help women create these buckets throughout their lifetime so that it will last them a lifetime, starting with that woman with her three kids, making sure that she has her emergency money set aside. And then if she has a job, then making sure that she is taking advantage of her company matching, or if she has a 401k plan to her company, that she's taking advantage of 
company matching. If her company says, I'm going to give you 3% if you put in 3%, that's so important. And you would not believe how many people work for companies that offer a 401k plan or a 403b plan that give matching contributions and they don't take advantage of it. All right. Well, I know what a 401k is. What's the other thing that you said? So 403b, 457, those are just, they're, they're like a 401k plan, but they're for people that work for maybe a government institution or for a nonprofit institution. Oh. So they're, they're uh, I think the you know, 457s and 403b are for like government employees. It's just like you working for a corporation that offers a 401k plan. So, so people that work in these industries, making sure that they're putting money in those, uh, that long-term bucket, because when you put money in that long-term bucket, bucket, it grows tax deferred, meaning that if you have any gains on that money, you don't have to pay tax on it until you are required. We well, now it's 72 until you're required by the government to take money out. So that's that long-term bucket. And then we go back to, and I'll go to the guaranteed bucket. And in my industry, the only place you can use the word guarantee is through, uh, if you talk about social security right now, that's guaranteed. Um, uh, annuities are guaranteed. Um, people that have, um, um, let me see, life insurance, cash values of life insurance are guaranteed too. And pension plans are guaranteed. So those are the four guaranteed buckets buckets that you can have social security pensions uh annuities and cash value and life insurance uh now my favorite bucket is that midterm bucket which is is money where you're investing it you're putting money away in, in real estate stocks but you have access to that money you can take the money out without you being penalized because a lot of times you'll have people that will put money in their retirement accounts and take it out and then they're penalized because you're going to be hit with a penalty if you put money in a retirement account and you take it out. So it's to your advantage to create this middle bucket of money that will allow you to invest it just like the money that you're putting in your retirement account. But you're not hit with a penalty if you decide to take the money out. So, okay, so with her, so with that mom is that I kind of go through and make sure, you know, let's, let's do your emergency first are you taking advantage of the things that your employer offers you? Now let's go start creating your middle bucket where we can start investing. And that's where, you know, the, the stocks come in, the mutual funds come in and what have you. Okay. So let's, let's stay in that space about the things that employees kind of offer. Cause I think most people don't even know what that is. Really? And you'd be amazed. Like I have, I, I did it when I was younger, uh -huh. there were some things that taught me a figure offer. I didn't, I didn't know any better, so I didn't take advantage of. Um, so outside of 401k, what are some other things so, that employees may offer? And, not, and that's not just the employer, it's something that you can do. So let's talk about some things that, for retirement. So you have your employer 401k plan that all companies don't offer, but a lot of them do. That's what your employer will offer you. It allows you to put money in um, tax, um, pre-tax. So it allows you to put the money in pre-tax and you can put it into this retirement account. So everyone listening to the sound of my voice, go to your company and see if they have a, a offer 401k plan and start, take baby steps. It may be that you put in 3% of your money. And then every time you get a raise, you give your investments a raise. If I get a raise, if I get a 3% raise, it may be that I increase my retirement contribution is 1% and I keep the two. So you take baby steps until you get up to your company matching. Now all companies don't have this, but uh, companies are incentivized because it's a tax benefit for them mm -hmm. uh, to um, maybe um, offer you matching. So if you put in money, they may match your contribution. So that's like free, don't walk away from that. That's free money. Um, and then some things that you can do if you don't, if your company uh, doesn't have a retirement account, a uh, 401k plan, is that you can open up an IRA or a Roth, a traditional IRA or Roth IRA. Uh, and the difference between a traditional IRA and a Roth IRA is really based on your income. I actually think if you compare the two, the Roth IRA is the best thing since sliced bread. And the reason why I say that is because you can put money in a Roth IRA and it grows tax deferred and tax free. So when you, and you're not mandated to take the money out because we talk about all of these things that are tax deferred, but eventually 
the government is going to say, hey, it's time to pay the piper. Mm. You got to pay taxes on all this money. But a Roth IRA is is different. And that's why I mean by it's the best thing since sliced bread, because you don't is is after tax money and you don't have to worry about the taxes when you take it out. Okay. So I know we were all over the place and that is. Well, no, because in my head, I'm like, okay, I'm trying to get the, 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 the basic stuff. I'm like, I want to get the basic stuff out of the way because that's what I will be, be able to take away. So the basics with that mom is to start with her employer first and take advantage of what her company offers her in terms of retirement. If her company doesn't, then she can try to open up an uh, IRA a traditional or a Roth IRA. If she qualifies for the Roth, do the Roth IRA first because that's based on her income. All right, and in the, the short term, she can get on Robinhood or Cash App and buy her some little one or $2 stocks to get started? If she want, wants to, yeah, but, but just remember when you buy individual stocks, there's more risk involved in opening up a mutual fund because it's more diversified. Diversification uh, means that you have more in there in the event that one goes down. So you want you want diversification. The problem with with a lot of people owning the individual stocks is that they can't get enough of them to diversify their portfolio. So if you just if you just invest in one thing and if it goes down, then you may have um, lost your money. And then people don't necessarily know the risk involved in it. So I would suggest that if you're buying stocks and you invest, uh, you do some research and know what you're buying. And don't just listen to your friend. Say, <laughs> hey girl, do this. Cause I, when I was young, when I first started out, I, I would just, I listened to a girlfriend and lost my money. Ooh. Yeah, I lost money in stocks. And I didn't know, I didn't know about holding it. I probably wouldn't have lost it. Cause you really only lose when you sell. People don't realize you lose money when you sell your stock. So you're not going to lose until you sell it. So I didn't know at the time that some, there were some things I probably should have held on to. All right. Yeah. All right. So how do people get in touch with you? Oh, wow. That's great. So um, you can follow me on my uh, website at um, obnwealthadvisors.com or onebucketnation.com. You can just go there and go to contact and find me. All right, really quickly, tell us about this book. Oh, my book. I'm so excited. It just came out in uh, October. It is an Amazon bestseller. Let me just, we talked about money. Well, credit is another issue that we have and people that are unicorns. And these are people that consistently have these 800 credit scores. They have access to better interest rates, mm. uh, better credit cards, more spending power. And when you have good credit, uh, people treat you differently. And that helps that business owner. If people, you know, if you want to start a business, people, that's how you can build your business credit through your personal credit. So your credit is another, uh, credit is another issue that we have when we look at the wealth gap, when we look at the fact that people that have poor credit are spending far more money coming out of their pocket than people that have great credit. So this book shares with with the readers how they can become members of this 800 credit score club all right everybody so there you have it we just want to give you a nice foundation of course about the every guest has to come back at some point because i never get into much of anything because we're always out of time but you have a good foundation by which especially my women of color to by which to build your road to financial success so special thanks to mr terrell dinkins for being with us Thank today you. i appreciate you and we will see you guys next monday same time same place on the leadership blend television show with your host ricardo d rice